We have a lot of end-of-the-world scenarios. Nuclear Holocaust. One nuclear bomb can ruin your whole day. It was true back in the late 1950s, and it's just as true now. The world could end at any moment thanks to the countless nukes out there just lying around. According to a 2010 Plowshares Fund report, 22,000 nuclear warheads are scattered around the globe. Or look at this. Black holes. When black holes, when massive stars collapse, they produce an immense gravitational pull along the way, drawing everything in its path, including light, towards its core. Like a giant vacuum cleaner from which there's no escape. So while black holes sit at the center of most galaxies, including our own, the real danger comes from a discovery made in the year 2000. We now have conclusive evidence, physicist Michael Kakao says, that there are wandering black holes, nomads, renegades, and right next to us in our own galaxy. We also have the idea of little tiny mini black holes produced by something known as a Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider, located in Geneva, Switzerland, might also produce antimatter. When you mix matter and antimatter, yeah, that might be a little bit of a problem. Gamma ray bursts are high energy beams of electromagnetic radiation shot out of a supernova or exploding star. Researchers say a routine gamma ray burst within 3,000 light years of the Earth would release more than enough radiation to completely cook our planet. Supervolcanoes are a bit more like Mount St. Helens on steroids. The explosion of such a giant volcano would pump enough ash and sulfuric acid into the atmosphere to blot out the sun and bring on a sequel to the Ice Age. And no, we don't mean another one of those animated movies. Scientists calculate that 71,000 500 years ago, a Sumatran supervolcano exploded, plunging the Earth into a decade-long volcanic winter, the effects of which reduced the total human population to less than 10,000 individuals. Worse, Sumatra is just one of six known supervolcanoes. Another, the largest in the world, is right next door in Yellowstone National Park. Unfortunately, scientists have discovered that Yellowstone erupts roughly once every 600,000 years, with the last explosion occurring about 630,000 years ago. Loss of biodiversity. We know that with human intervention on the ecosystems, we have quite a number of organisms being removed from the planet. What kind of doom does this spell for us? Solar flares are jets of plasma shooting out from the sun. In 1859, British astronomer Richard Carrington witnessed the greatest one on record. Telegraph lines were electrified, shocking technicians causing fires and shutting the entire system down. A solar flare in today's vast interconnected power grid could cause massive outages, radio blackouts, satellite malfunctions, telecommunication system meltdowns, and so on. Ever since scientists figured out that it was an impact of an asteroid 10 kilometers wide that wiped out the dinosaurs. They've been hunting the skies for species-ending space rocks. An estimated 90% of these 3,200-foot-long big boys have been found, although none pose immediate danger. But we've barely begun drawing our maps and the smaller rocks, and therein lies the real problem. In 1908, an asteroid less than 40 meters wide exploded over Siberia, leveling forests for hundreds of square miles. If that had happened above Toronto, Out of all the scenarios, the one that's probably most likely to be a problem is bioterrorism. Look at these words. Smallpox, plague, anthrax. Most of these are caused by viruses. When you watch all these zombie movies, it seems like 2012 was the year of the zombie. Every single movie, media, TV show was talking about zombies in some way. And a lot of these zombie storylines are based on viruses. So the idea of a virus spreading around the world and being responsible for the deaths of literally millions of people is actually realistic. The idea that a virus could become a plague that kills a large portion of the human population is not science fiction. The Spanish flu, smallpox, and plague are all real examples of viruses that killed millions of people. Okay, really? A virus reanimating a person that causing them to eat brain matter so they can continue to trundle around the planet is somewhat absurd, but the actions of viruses are not. Take a moment to go to this website. There's a 12-minute video. Watch it. It'll give you some background about viruses. To the casual observer, a virus may be mistaken as a living organism. They have a rich diversity.
Are viruses alive? They do use either RNA or DNA as their genetic storehouse. They also contain a protein in similar ratios as typical cells found in other organisms. They can adapt very quickly to changing conditions, often mutating when exposed to various medicines designed to destroy them. However, as we explored in the earlier part of this course, there are numerous factors that are used to define a living organism, including the fact that all living organisms are made up of cells. Viruses are not made up of cells. They are not technically living, according to our definition we'll use here at Suzuki. The ability, the ability to reproduce on your own is a key characteristic of living organisms. Viruses are not only able to reproduce by taking over genetic machinery of the host cell, and they cannot reproduce by themselves. Viruses are able to infiltrate all types of cells and are often classified based on the type of organism that they infect. Due to a specific pattern of proteins on the protein coat which surrounds viruses, they are able to open a passage into the host cell. These patterns are very specific and normally will only open up on, on a specific type of cell. Once a virus has opened a passage into the host cell, it unloads its genetic material and takes control. Instead of producing sugar or acting in a protective capacity, this co-opted cell may either be destroyed or become a viral factory. Since viruses require a sophisticated match to the host cell that they infect, they normally will only attack a very specific type of cell. A plant virus, like the tobacco mosaic virus, can only infect plant cells of the tobacco plant. Animal viruses, like the bird flu viruses, will only attack related animal cells. Bacteriophages, often shortened to just phage, viruses that specifically attack bacterial cells are often used by biomedical researchers as tools to control bacterial diseases or gene therapies. The structure of a virus is well suited to its function, entering a host cell and reproducing. A virus is composed of a relatively short piece of nucleic acid surrounded by a protein coat. Some viruses also have other outer membranes that merge with the host cell's membrane, making it easier for the virus to infect the cell. Since the virus doesn't have its own cellular machinery, it must use the host cell to make copies of itself. Viruses are inimical. They are perfectly designed to spread from one organism